So today I'm going to talk about terrasage. Uh, terrasage alata is the terminology or the term for it, but you'll hear it called terrasage a lot, where it's just terrasage cut down. Terrasage alata is a term that comes from the Greeks, and it's a fine particle clay for burnishing and polishing. So when we look at the table here, we have a piece that is finished with horsehair and emu feathers, and I'll talk about the different materials in a little bit. This piece is already bisced, and it has the sage, but I put a yellow coloring in it versus this one has a light blue. This one is the one I'm going to talk about in a little while where we're going to polish it and talk about how do you polish this to make it even shinier. Okay, uh, Sidges are used, they're very fine particle clay. Historically, they are used to polish a piece of pottery to make a, a bond of the clay particles extremely tight where it will hold moisture or water. It might sweat a little bit through the foot or the bottom of it still, but historically it was early process use of fine particle clay to seal pottery before glazing. Now with this, I have a piece here that's leather hard. And if you look up terrasage or painting terrasage or terrasage a lot of online, you're going to see a lot of debate on timing. When do you put it on? How thick you put it on? Um, how thin you put it on? Uh, what happens when it starts peeling? This piece actually, if you look at it, you can see the little speckles. This started peeling. Actually, it was okay until I drove today, and it peeled in the car because I might have needed to wrap it up. I should mention um, surfaces are usually really fragile, so it's real easy for this to happen. But I'm also testing clay bodies because I'm testing the slip to the clay body for proper fit. And the thicker the sage, the more chance of it peeling. So this sage might have been put on too, too thick. So that's another thing that we'll be working on during this class is thickness to thinness, what's too much, what's too little, and that's something we just learned through time. Now the main debate online and in history is timing. When do you put the slip on? Some people like to put the slip on when it's in a leather hard state. That's what this one is. You know, it's been trimmed and I already polished it a little bit with a metal rib um, on the wheel. But now that it's in the leather hard state, I, that's when I normally put sage on. Um, but based on the clay body, it might be better to put it on when it's bone dry. Because this clay, when it gets to bone dry, will shrink some more. And sometimes that could cause the peeling or the cracking. So we have to experiment with that. Today, I'm doing one that's leather hard. I have a sister piece to this on the shelving unit right now that I'm not going to demo today. But I'm going to put it on bone dry, and then in the classroom I'll save these two pieces so we can talk about the difference. So normally I put it on leather hard, mostly because of the way I polish. So in here I have a sigillata. There's commercial ones, and then we're making our own. I'm making some right now for you that we're going to experiment with, and I will also have a little bit of the commercial kind. Um, over time, I've used both. And sometimes... I'll be showing you uh, what's considered a more raw way to use a sage. It is you'll see me sometimes take the slip from my pottery bucket from throwing. So when you throw, remember those fine particles, the ball clay, is what's coming off on the wheel and on your hands, that really smooth material. So sometimes I'll take the top layer of my um, slip bucket from throwing, once it gets really thick, and I'll actually use that as a sage along. And we'll, and, or take some of that, pour it into this. Uh, the way I got these colors, you know, when we look at the colored ones, I actually mixed a colorant into this. This is a white by itself. Um, the other color we'll normally have is a red, which is really traditional. Iron red and white are the two traditional colors. So you just paint this on, and you'll see it looks like skim milk, and it'll drip down. And on the leather hard pieces like this, it gets a little bit streaky, but I want to start with thin coats. So I just work, oh, and I should mention really quick, the type of brush is really important. I use a soft bristle brush that I've already made sure to check that the hairs have come loose. Any hairs that come off into the sage could also peel the sage. So you just want to be careful with the type of brush. Sometimes I use sponge brushes to put it on, but you'll see that this is a really, really thin coat that I'm placing on. Now, you want to be careful with drips, so I'm going to go all the way to the bottom because the drips will show up. But that might be an aesthetic. That might be something you want to see. You might want to see the streaks. 
that's going to be a decision you get to make with practice and time. You know, um, some clay bodies you might not need to put a sidge on. If you're using, I'll use the example of B mix uh, with sand or without sand, and you polish the surface by hand on the wheel and then in the leather hard state, you might not need a sitch. So, but with this LB blend, it's really gritty. It's not gonna work the same way. So I'm putting the slip on to give it that foundational layer like makeup. It's its undercoat right now. So once I put a coat on, I, put, I leave the brush in the material like this in one of my bowls that I've made. And I put it to the side. I'll put this to the side and I have to wait till that sheen dries a little bit. Then I can put a second coat on. I normally put two coats on my pieces for, uh, of the sigillata for any of my firing processes from foil sager to traditional sager to pit fire to horsehair raku, um, naked raku, which we'll talk about also in another video. The th when they're really, really thick, they peel a lot. And I've had that problem over the years. Now let's talk about polishing. Now there's a couple different ways to polish pieces. You can see this already has a sheen to it, naturally, you know, because this particle's really, really pure. Okay, so this one I prepped yesterday and kept it covered up. It is leather hard also, actually a little bit drier leather hard. So at this date, I actually one of the main tools I use is a sponge, and I go in this in one direction. And the first thing, the reason for the sponge is if there's any sand particles, this will knock it off. If there was any dust that came on overnight naturally, or I already make sure I use a clean new bag when I cover pieces like this, because I don't want clay particles to fall onto the slip. And then I'll start polishing by just moving the sponge. And usually I use a new sponge or I use a really worn out sponge to start polishing. And you'll start seeing the sheen appear as you go visually. So I usually start on the rims. And if your sitch is too thin and, you, and there's sand in it, the sand will come and scratch it. And you'll see that. Now, if we're foil sagering this, that might not matter. The smoke is going to hide most of that. You also, at the right time, you'll know that you're doing this at the right time if the sponge is not getting really coated with color. Another tool that's used a lot is spoons. And you can just start polishing by rubbing the spoon against it as you go down. But some people don't like to polish leather hard pieces with a spoon because it leaves more of a mark. Okay, So you can see more line work. But that might be an aesthetic you want. So normally I use a spoon a lot, and I use these types of spoons which fit my thumb really well. And I use a spoon a lot when the piece is bone dry versus leather hard. My main go-to is actually chamois cloths and plastic bags. So um, you'll read online, some people use um, grocery bags to polish. I usually just wrap my fingers and my whole hand, and I just start rubbing against the piece. And you'll notice I keep going in the same direction. If I, I'm going in this direction here, if I switch and go the opposite direction, you will go against your polish sometimes and it won't polish up. You know? And you can see that, that it'll start getting a little bit shinier as you go and it just takes practice. When I do it by hand like this, I spend 10, 15 minutes doing this. In this video demo, I'm not gonna spend that long on it. The other way I polish is I actually pull the bag tight and rub it against the piece. Again, just like if you're polishing your shoes. And you just gotta be careful not to knock the piece down. Sometimes, actually, a lot of times when I'm doing this by hand, I don't use the turntable. I just put it down on the table and then it's a lot more stable. And I usually move the bag around because sometimes the bag gets dusty and the dust will make you lose this sheen. Let me show you. Um, you can see, I can see that it's getting shinier and you can keep just going and going until you get this piece just really high polished. Now, a polished piece, when you polish it and we bisque it, when we put this in the bisque fire, you can see this piece here has a yellow sidge. It's not as polished. There's some spots that are a little bit shinier and a little bit duller. Here's where the sand is. This was a little bit thinner. So what happened was after I did this piece and it started peeling a little bit, I thinned the sidge down 
onto this one so it's a little bit drier. So I'm experimenting with my thickness of my sidges as I go. So we'll see how this holds up. Its sister piece is the one I'm firing currently and we'll see was horsehair and materials, okay? So you just keep doing this until the pot gets super dry or until you feel like quitting. Each of us have our own personal aesthetic, our personal use of materials. I actually use a little bit of um, corn oil on my pieces when, so I'll polish this like I'm doing right now, leather hard. I'll wait till this dries more and it's getting closer to bone dry. Then I'll put a little bit of corn oil on this and repolish. And that might, and that, and I usually do that on the top to bring even a higher sheen. And so it's about experimentation. And we'll be talking about that in the class as we go. I'll be demoing this live too. Of course, this one you can see now, it still has a sheen, but it's ready for the next layer to be painted on. And the reason I like to paint it on leather hard pieces is because the moisture in the clay, of the natural clay, of the thrown peas, and the moisture in the sidge, to me, I always feel that it makes a better bond. Okay. Now, another way to check if it's ready, if you touch it and you leave a fingerprint, it's too wet. Okay. So that's a key part too. So you can feel right now this is tacky, but it's not leaving, my fingers are not leaving marks. So it's actually ready for the next layer. So over here, I, I have feathers that, that I'm going to test and see if we can see how much of a mark appears with the feather or the carbon. I have emu feathers which is what's on this piece. That's what made these lines that look like ferns. Uh, there's a nice one right there. Then I also have, I'll probably just grab the bag of it. I have horse hair, and that's what makes the black lines. So by putting these on the piece. And the temperature range, usually 1100 to 1300 degrees. So I have a heat gun, a thermal heat gun, that I check to see how hot this piece is. Like right now, I go against my pot and it's 63 degrees on the surface of this piece, okay? So when I'm firing, I check the surface of the piece so I know if it's too hot, the carbon won't stay. If it's too cold, when you wash it, the carbon will come off, okay? So we have to have, so timing is important. One real quick thing that's always asked, if you, once you put this sidge on and you burnish it, you can fire this to higher temperatures. It's just gonna get less polished the hotter it goes. So if you take this to high temperature in the gas kiln and you put a clear glaze on the inside, this won't be shiny anymore. It'll be dry. But you, could all, but you can always put a glaze over the whole thing and then this will come through the clear glaze. And no matter what color we're using. Of course, our yellows become more muted, our reds become more muted. This green would be really close to this green in the high fire temperature.